Hi everyone, this is Meredith, uh, marketing lead at Charge Hound, and we're gonna start here in a couple of minutes, but we'll give people a, a little bit more time to join us today, but we're excited and thanks for coming. All right, we're a couple minutes past 9.30, so I think it's time for us to get started. But thank you for joining our customer spotlight webinar today with NetProtect. Uh, we'll be talking about NetProtect's journey to holistic chargeback management. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Meredith Sweeney, marketing lead at ChargeHound, and really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us today. Um, before I move on to our speakers, I just wanted to note that there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, but don't hesitate to submit them throughout the presentation. We'll keep this pretty conversational, and so we can really answer questions as they come up. And today's webinar is brought to you by Paul V. Kubaopte, Head of Operations at Chargetown, and Jacob Wall, Vice President of Technical Operations at NetProtect. And with that, I will turn it over to them to give a proper introduction of themselves. Hi everyone, this is Paula V from Chargehound. Uh, like Meredith said, I, I head up operations over here, uh, which basically means, you know, working with our merchants and our partners to make sure, uh, you know, people can successfully adopt our automation technology, drive revenue with their chargebacks and uh, kind of maximize the returns of that process. Um, and, you know, Jacob and I have been working together for a little while now. So Jacob, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Hi, my name is Jacob Wall. I run technical operations at NetProtect, which is a subsidiary of J2 Global, and manage infrastructure for the services that we offer throughout the world, and also take a role within managing risk before and then after the transaction. Awesome. So just a quick background on ChargeHound. Um, we're based here in the Bay Area in Oakland, California. Um, we're the only end-to-end -end automated chargeback solution in the market. Um, so what that means is that when merchants use ChargeHound technology, they can fully automate and instantly fight uh, over 250,000 disputes per minute. So it just brings them, you know, instant scale and just drives up performance. But we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more. Um, Jacob, could you tell us a little bit about NetProtect? Yeah, so NetProtect, it we have two different sides of the business. We have the cloud-based VPN service as well as storage and syncing of your files. So if you're not familiar with that, what we do is we create secure connections from any of your devices out to the internet and then back. So we do that within a consumer and a business vertical. And we also have a consumer and business vertical on our Sugar sync business, which securely accesses your files from the cloud. Awesome. Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, a little bit more background on internet security? Uh, and I know, you know, we had talked about some changes in the landscape and, and how that affected NetProtect. Could you give us a, a bit of background there? Yeah. So people are becoming more and more aware of, you know, what does the privacy landscape look like? So. With that, people are taking a more proactive approach. An example of one that we were, we saw great adoption was from the FCC ruling 
that allowed ISPs to then sell your browsing data. So even though you're paying your ISP, whatever that may be per month, they still want to be able to harvest more information and you become more of a uh, revenue generating opportunity for them. And also when it comes to like just basic access to the internet, net neutrality, if you all remember a few years back, Netflix was very vocal about not having, uh, I guess they believe free access to Comcast users. And so people want to be able to have an internet experience that is what they pay for to get. And then in general, when you look at, you know, breaches that are happening. So Cambridge Analytica, which was not necessarily a breach in and of itself, but people were having their user information then targeted against them for a variety of things that Equifax had. Uh, you know, general Wi-Fi at the airport that's unsecure, people having their credentials taken. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, as we've talked, it's been clear you guys are really in a space that's that's experiencing a lot of growth and, and you guys are really poised for the opportunity. Um, so I'm going to take us through to kind of what we're planning to discuss today and, and frame that up um, for everyone listening. Uh, so, you know, I think something that's been top of mind for everyone, especially in payments in the past few months, um, is, you know, business leaders have really had to um, shift their way of thinking to addressing problems with fewer resources and at a scale that we really haven't experienced before. And obviously, you know, that's due in large part to the global pandemic that we're all experiencing right now and how that's changed, um, you know, customer behavior, how that kind of suddenly changed the transaction landscape in, in a lot of verticals um, and, and kind of changed the calculation on, on cost and how many resources, um, you know, businesses can really dedicate to, um, you know, risk processes that are suddenly more important than, than they ever have been. Um, and so, you know, at Chargehound, obviously we are, are huge proponents of, of adopting technology and, and using automation to um, solve these, these business problems and, and these pain points. Um, and so with our automation technology, it really provides businesses with the first ever scalable chargeback solution and really presents this huge opportunity um, for businesses to really increase revenue um, while eliminating the need for, um, you know, dedicating precious employee time to, to this effort. Um, and so we really wanted to spotlight NetProtect uh, and how NetProtect, you know, several years ago has been able to start adopting automation technology and, and really transform their chargeback process um, and achieve you know, a few of these things, removing all manual work from the chargeback process, uh, implementing automation across multiple payment processors, across multiple business units, and really achieving that scale. And then on top of all of that, really driving their chargeback performance up uh, and, and maximizing their, their revenue recovery. Um, and so just wanted to use this opportunity to really highlight how NetProtect thought about this business problem and, and how they went about solving it. Um, Jacob, anything you wanted to add here? Not here. I, I'll get into it in the next few slides. Awesome. So just to kind of frame up, you know, why we're talking about this now and, and why we've heard from merchants that it's, it's so important, um, there's a few chargeback trends going on in, in the space. Um, first of all, from mid-March until the end of April, uh, credit card holders contested 2 to 3x as many purchases as they did before the pandemic. Um, and so this is a massive increase in uh, non-fraudulent uh, disputes, right? Uh, and, and that places a, a tremendous burden on, on merchants to really try and recover this revenue in a, in a time of a lot of business strain, right? Um, additionally, you can see before COVID as a result, chargebacks were maybe half a percent um, or 0.05 percent of, of credit card transactions. Uh, now in certain verticals, especially, you know, travel, entertainment, these chargebacks can be as high as 40% of all credit card transactions. So you can just see, you know, this problem has experienced tremendous um, and kind of shocking scale. Uh, and lastly, you know, when asked how COVID-19 has really impacted the use of technology at their organizations, 80% um, of, of people at uh, in businesses experiencing these, um, these strains are saying they're considering automation for the first time or accelerating their adoption of automation technology. And so um, it's really top of mind for, for most 
um, people experiencing these issues uh, and, and thinking about this business problem. Uh, and so, you know, since NetProtect really has um, kind of solved this business problem already, um, kind of wanted to highlight how, how you guys have, have thought about that. Um, so I guess to, um, to kind of put that in perspective of, of what that difference looks like. And, and Jacob, if you want to weigh in here on, um, you know, if this is kind of in line with what you guys have experienced, if you take, you know, a, a person responding to chargebacks versus automation technology, right, you can see the difference right off the bat. Um, it's tough for someone to keep up with chargeback volumes. So you're going to see about 50% uh, response rates, you're going to see that, you know, lower 20% win rate. Um, and on average, you're going to recover 5% of the AOV. And then you can really see how that performance drives up on all fronts um, with automation. 100% submission rate becomes possible uh, and consistent. So 100% there. Um, you can drive that win rate up because you're fighting more chargebacks with, you know, more robust evidence. Uh, so 33% win rate on average. And, you know, you can really recover a quarter of the AOV per chargeback, which is a, you know, 5x improvement. Um, Jacob, you kind of have lived, lived through this transition firsthand. Um, anything you kind of want to weigh in here? Is this in line with what you've seen? We definitely weren't responding to even half of the chargebacks when we were doing it all manually. And the win rate, we'll get to it later, was more in line with that. I would say for us, we're always eager to adopt new technology. We're a technology company, so it's easy for us to then justify something that's customer facing, or in this instance, it's improved in the back office for us. Awesome. Yeah. And kind of on that note, I kind of want to turn it over to you. And, and if you could walk us through NetProtect's chargeback journey over the past few years, um, I think, you know, we'd love to hear that. Yeah, so I was introduced by a colleague of mine who I worked with to charge on, set up a call with the team there. And what was interesting about the journey, and it's charge on always loves full automation, but what I was also really happy with is we spent the first year with a semi automated solution. So we had integrated ChargeHound into our smallest brand that we operate, which is back then was Cloak and now it's Encrypt.me. And it was super easy. I was doing every chargeback uh, rebuttal via a word template, and that takes a ton of time. Whereas with ChargeHound, we were able to pull probably about 80% of the information from Stripe and then just add in some manual um, related stuff around like service period end and so forth. And then we finally made the deep dive to adopt Stripe and really full automation with Stripe when we got a warning letter from, I forget if it was MasterCard or Visa, they have the, as you're approaching 1% of your transaction volume with chargebacks, they severely fine you if you don't take action. And so it was very clear that we needed to make changes within our organization on how we looked at, at fraud. And it's not just the chargeback rebuttals, it was also around when they're making a transaction, trying to reduce as much as possible. And with technology these days, there's a lot of, of different companies out there. So one that we work with right now is SIFT. So that's more behavioral AI and understanding the risk of a chargeback down the road. And then uh, tail end of last year, ChargeHound had come to us and said, hey, we just are finishing up our integration with PayPal. Is that something of interest? And our business is roughly 50-50 between credit card transactions and PayPal. So while we had almost 100% submission rate on Stripe, we still had a lot of manual work to do on the PayPal front. And we, to the previous slide, were not even submitting 50% of the disputes over there. And when we fully automated it, I think technically right now it's 99.6% submission rate for us. Um, so, and we'll get into the numbers later on how that has actually improved the bottom line of the business. Yeah, I think um, what what was interesting about NetProtect's journey was kind of, you guys set out um, to address these pain points that you would kind of isolate and that you understood and evolved as your business grew. Um, and, and you kind of tested out 
automation, using your Stripe volumes first, using one or two brands first, and then you really said, okay, you know, this is working and, and you leveled it up and, and went all in. And I think it's pretty um, relevant to a lot of businesses that are thinking about adopting automation, but don't know what that transformation will look like. Um, you guys are, are kind of a perfect case study. So I kind of want to um, take us back to kind of the beginning of, of when we started talking and, and talk a little bit about NetProtect's initial goals. So, um, you know, when you guys started thinking about what you wanted to change about your chargeback process, what were your goals that you set out, set out to achieve? So the initial focus was on revenue recovery. So to also take a step back, when we first were introduced to ChargeHound, we were a really small team. Um, right now, there's about 250 of us all around the world, and it was less than probably 10% of the size at that point when we were looking at charge on the first time. And so the business grew a significant amount. If you look at the chronological time, there was the FCC ruling, which was in mid 2017, and then you had neutrality get repealed. You had a lot of privacy related things that come out in the last few years, and that really hockey stick growth for our business. So it wasn't just here was a few hundred dollars a month of chargebacks. Now it was growing into a substantial sum of money in chargebacks every month. So when you look at it that way, that's, that's a huge missed opportunity for a business to not have taken action against it. And we drove a ton of efficiencies. It's not a, a doing chargebacks manually is not something that you're really excited about when you get done. You don't necessarily feel good about the work. It's monotonous and it's part of operating a business. And Chargehound removed all of that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing the way that you guys moved from, um, just to reiterate, from, you know, 100% manual, very analog process um, to really fully automating automation technology across your business and processors. Um, and I think that's something that I want to dig into a little bit more because I think it's it's really relatable to a lot of merchants that we speak to and work with um, and, and to kind of businesses at large. Um, so, you know, let's start from the beginning. Uh, you guys, you know, when we met, Jacob, you were um, manually reviewing and, and submitting your chargebacks. Um, tell us about what that kind of phase of your chargeback process looked like? It was Stripe nagging us for evidence. So then it was, okay, I have, I have a job to do. So back then, I believe I was product manager. It really means you got to wear a lot of hats and the company that's growing that quickly. And, you know, sometimes I miss the evidence due date. Actually, one of the folks here on the attending here from our team is very good about nagging from back in the day on any of the disputes that needed to be handled that I hadn't gotten done yet. But like I said earlier, it's, from experience, it's not a job that when you leave at the end of the day, you're feeling great about. Um, as we continue to grow, it went from, yeah, we could respond to almost every dispute to, all right, it's just however many you can get through. So there were other people within our group of folks here that were doing it. But even at that point, we couldn't keep up with 100% submission rate. And on top of that, when you look at the opportunity costs, it's huge. I mean, there were people who could be adding so much more value to the organization that were spending their time just doing chargebacks. And when you can relinquish someone from that and have that person be able to do something that they're passionate about and get positively impacted business beyond just chargebacks, that's incredibly impactful. Yeah, and to kind of quantify what that process looked like for you guys, could you take us through some of um, kind of these baseline results where you guys started from? Yeah, so the chargebacks, unless you're really good about automating templates with uh, like work, it, it takes a decent amount of time because you have to, you take the initial chargeback that came from Stripe, then you got to go and reference that to the customer, and then you got to find basic information like when they signed up, what IP did they come from? When did they validate their email address with us? Did that come from the same exact IP or not? Service end date. Did they submit support tickets that can then justify or show evidence that they were actively using the product and that they knew what they were paying for? And that's when you're trying to find the friendly fraud. All of that stuff takes time. And you know, 
we had weekly reporting that showed to go back earlier here, we have weekly reporting that looks at the amount of refunds and chargebacks. So I want to touch on that a little bit. So what way we look at it is holistically. And the reason we do that is if you compare those two numbers together, it shows us, did we miss the mark on delivering the actual service? So from a marketing perspective, onboarding a customer, all the things that are related to friendly fraud when it comes to chargebacks or just in general, we lost revenue that we initially had received. And then looking at how much legitimate fraud we have. So when you look at the numbers there, yeah, the, the win rate's not horrible, but as we'll touch on later, it's substantially better today, um, especially compared to the other cohort of customers that Georgetown has that have done webinars as well. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, and I think something we talked about a lot and, and we really try to highlight at Chargehound is, um, you know, your win rate is, is fundamentally affected by your submission rate, right? So, you know, when you have a million different jobs to do and, and manually responding to your chargebacks becomes one component of that, um, even your revenue recovery, you know, you could have a 100% win rate, but if you're only fighting 10% of your disputes, um, then you're actually only recovering 10% of your revenue. And, and so that just that pie expands um, the more disputes you actually fight. Um, and talk to us a little bit about, I know when we had initially met, one of par the parts of that conversation was the, the fees you guys were, were receiving for fighting chargebacks, or sorry, for receiving chargebacks. Yeah, so every time we lose, we pay Stripe 15 bucks, and that adds up, especially at the scale that we operate now. Even though our chargebacks are very low, uh, you look at win rate at 20%, so 80% of all of the counts of disputes cost us $15. In our business, if you go to our website, price ranges from, with promotions, $5 on, on a monthly to you know, up to 60 bucks. So if someone signs up for a $5 monthly subscription and then we lose $15, that costs us a ton of money to um, you know, facilitate that transaction. And then also paired with Chargehound, when I talked about earlier, taking a step back, the kind of service that we're in is much, it's a platform. And so if we have a bad actor that's using us, using a stolen credit card to then be on our network, then for example, with the VPN, there's still a shared IP. So if they go to buy shoes online and they use that stolen credit card, then that merchant may not want to accept orders from us down the road later. So there is very much a, a um, goal within our organization to reduce the amount of bad actors we have. And then the only chargebacks that we get are then friendly fraud. Won't be perfect at it, but it in the end protects good customers because all of those things, just like you know, shoplifting in, in the context of, of retail stores, all that cost gets passed down at some point to the end customer. And to touch a little bit around getting started at Georgetown, one of the things that I really enjoyed was a very consultative approach. So it's, when you look at an ROI of adopting something like implementing a Georgetown, it, you, you have to have numbers, at least in the numbers person. So they understood when we sent them a sample of what our disputes look like, they have the historical information on what win rates may look like at scale. Okay, now you're telling me that we can recover X amount of dollars. That, that makes it much easier to justify the time spent. Oops, sorry about that. Is this still being shared? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Sorry, I just clicked something. Um, all right, so let's get into um, let's get into some of your results when you decided to um, automate partially with Stripe. What um, kind of how did that initial pilot go for you guys? What were the the improvements that you saw? So we operate multiple brands, and one of the brands that we operate is it used to be called Cloak, but now it's called Encrypt and that one is exclusively using Stripe. So that would have and then in-app purchases, but there's no interaction on chargebacks there. Uh, with the Stripe, we then could get 100% coverage. And by taking an incremental approach, it wasn't very hard to implement it with that brand. And then we could say, all right, if this works here, then we can scale it to the other brands um, and get time slotted 
there. And it's interesting because when we were in this partial automation phase was also when we had rebranded from being club to encrypt me. And part of me believes that we missed the mark on the customer being notified in a way that was very clear that the statement descriptor was going to update. And so we actually saw this large uptick in chargebacks when we had changed what the statement descriptor looked like. And that was people being confused as it looked like an unrecognized charge to them. And having charge on, even though at that point it was not fully automated, it made it a whole lot easier to quickly take action on those. And then one of the neat things within the dashboard is you can just click on an email and it will generate uh, you know, an email saying, hey, we saw that you had disputed this and you know, change it up a little bit, helping get people to actually close those disputes. So I'd also say with EncryptMe, what was nice is it's very agile of a brand for us. It's our smallest brand that we operate. And it's easy to get feedback because we have engaged customers. So we tend to try everything there before doing the larger ship with our other brands that we operate. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, it's not uncommon for merchants to pilot with us maybe with one processor or partial, um, you know, one business unit before they fully commit to automation across their, their platform. Uh, and I will say, you know, we're very proud. We, we haven't lost a pilot yet. Um, and so it's a great way to really prove out that ROI that you're mentioning, Jacob. Um, especially if you have, you know, other members of your team or business leaders that need to be more convinced or, or more familiar with the cost savings and, um, you know, what you can really drive from, from technology in this process. So I think, you know, from what I remember, you guys automated partial volumes with Stripe, you know, it went really well. Um, and, and Jacob, you were able to kind of get buy-in and, and really recognize the value and say, I want to go all in on this um, and kind of expand that across your guys' platform to, to full automation. So tell us a little bit about um, that process and, and, you know, getting that off the ground. So with the business growing at a hockey stick, it's, you have to then prioritize. It makes sense to do X, Y, or Z, and there's an opportunity cost involved. Uh, with that, it was clear with ChargeHound that we were gonna make it back. We definitely spent a, probably a little too long in the partial automation phase, but we're here. Can't, can't change the decisions that we made in the past. And then once we, we were fully automated, a lot of small little tweaks, you know, format of templates. Do banks care about having short or long form? Do, is there value? I think there is value in having a quick submission. So if someone, changes or they submit a chargeback and we can get back to them within an hour, I think that gives us validity there. Yeah, and I think um, something that, that we had talked about is obviously ChargeHound is a strategic partner of, of PayPal. Um, and so getting that you know up and off the ground was, was really seamless for you guys. And so you had the proof of concept, you had part of the technology in place and then, um, you know, Getting that those getting those additional volumes added were were pretty easy. Can you talk a little bit about what the integration was like that second time around? Yeah, so I actually was looking back at this, and so start to finish, it did take us four months using two of our developers. And while at face value that seems like a lot, there were also a lot of different tasks that we were juggling at that time. So before I jumped on the webinar today, I went back to our code commits and all in the start to finish it's 584 lines of code and that encompasses all the automation including you know we're a subscription service so we actually don't cancel the accounts unless we lose the dispute um so all the, the cleanup there gathering all the evidence looking at you know the purchasing ip uh, uh, and so forth so it really wasn't that bad. Could we have done it quicker? Possibly. Um, I know actually one of the people here is the manager of our web development team that managed that process. So I think it was more so just a matter of slotting in enough time. Yeah, definitely. And, and juggling multiple priorities. Um, as I know you guys were, were going really quickly. I love that you went back and looked at how many lines of code that was. Um, for a better perspective, in case some of our listeners are more non-technical, can you put 584 lines of code in perspective for us? Is that a lot, a little? 
for the applications that we work with and we develop, I would say that that's pretty small. Awesome. Um, so let's talk through some of the results. We've been talking about how you guys were going all in on the ROI here, but what did that actually look like? Can you walk us through, um, you know, the, the performance you guys have actually realized from, from this integration? Yeah, so at this point, almost everything. So we, I had touched on this earlier. So technically 99.6% of chargebacks have no problem. And that's usually more so a data thing on our end where we got to figure out why the automation doesn't work. So I, I don't spend a whole lot of time within Chargeout. I get the daily reports and then look back at how we're doing month on month. And the win rate, what, what's crazy to me is the fact that we only have plus or minus two and a half percent variance on our win rate every month. So it's very consistent, even in months that are higher chargebacks, like with COVID, uh, you know, we're consistently getting back almost 50%, which is super impactful when you think about the $15 fee that we would have otherwise paid on the 50% that, that are one, or that we no longer have to pay on the ones that we want. Yeah, and I think what was pretty remarkable for you guys is, is you quadrupled your, your submission rate and you, you know, more than doubled um, that win rate. And how did that kind of, um, did you expect that? Was that, was that better than what you expected? Did this achieve your, your goals in terms of performance? So what's interesting there is, so the win rate is a lot higher because of PayPal these days. With Stripe, we were winning roughly when it comes to credit cards, about a third of the transaction, maybe 40% of them. Uh, with PayPal, it does seem to be a lot friendlier with respect to subscription services. And I'm not sure why there's such a stark difference outside of you know, PayPal used to be the other way around historically. But this beat all of our expectations. When working with so to negotiate the deal with charging on, I don't think anyone thought that the win rate would, would be this far lifted. Yeah, that's awesome. We we love to we love to hear that. Um, I'm just gonna give everyone in the audience a quick heads up before we move on um, that we're gonna start taking a Q and A in, in about 10 minutes. So if you want to submit questions, um, definitely you know go for it in, in the next few minutes. Um, so Jacob, coming back to this, I know revenue recovery was really a primary goal and, and priority for you guys, but we also talked about you know some of the things beyond. Um, you know, just the numbers that, that you guys experienced um, in terms of success. So talk to us a little bit about um, what this looked like for you guys. So from the employee experience and the individuals that had worked on at some point in time, charge bikes, it's not an exciting task to do and people are a lot more creative and can have a much greater impact when they're not tied up with something that's monotonous as so this. So that, that's huge. And then on the customer experience side, I've, I'd actually rather touch on reactive to proactive now. Now that the chargebacks are taken care of, we can spend more time on the prevention piece, which then rolls into improving the customer experience because by beating out fraudulent customers, then less bad things happen on our network. So in the same concept of if Uber got rid of all the bad drivers, then that's a much better improved customer experience when you're riding with them. So it, it's a really nice circle to just keep going back and and has, I think, really helped the business overall beyond just the numbers. So the, the non-quantitative, or the, all the qualitative for us. Yeah, and I think it's great that you guys really took a holistic view to, to measuring success. So, you know, once you checked off that revenue recovery increase box, you also went and looked at, okay, where are the other places we can leverage it, leverage this to, to improve our business, um, which I, I think is really important. Um, so let's take kind of a look back. I know, um, as we have uh, talked, you know, over the, the years and months, these were problems that you guys were solving in real time, right? And, and um, automation for charge racks is still, is still relatively new, right? And um, I think what a lot of businesses struggle with is, is you know, they are solving these problems in real time. They don't know for sure what's going to come out the other side. Um, and so, you know, you guys have already gone through this. You've, you've tussled this out and you've seen the results. Um, what would you, you know, what would you say looking back, um, you know, what would you have told yourself in 2018? Focus on automating sooner, like true full automation across all of the brands that we operate. 
Um, it's hard to look and see that hundreds of thousands of dollars were left on the table, but there's nothing that we can do that will change the decisions that we made. We made those in, you know, with the best information we had available, those were what we thought the best um, decisions that we could make for the business. And then part of here is there's been a, a shift in the way that we look at decision-making within our organization. And so that also helps us be much more, you know, concrete with our decisions on how it's going to impact the business. So the framework that we use internally is REI. And so it's risk, effort, and impact. And had we have just looked at charge hound and the implementation from this perspective, we would have seen that there's little to no risk. I can't really think of a risk that could be, you know, seen by adding chargeback automation. And the effort is relatively small compared to the other projects that we take on in our organization. And then you have the impact, which is strong. I mean, we've recovered, you know, six figures worth of dollars here. That's insanely impactful to a business, especially in light of these days where businesses are trying to, you know, save as much revenue as they can. Yeah, I think, you know, this framework is, is really valuable because I think um, when we are talking about a new technology, maybe in a part of your business where technology or automation haven't been an option or a priority, um, it can be hard to figure out, you know, the framework to think about that in and to understand, you know, is this worth taking on right now? Will it have impact that will scale and multiply the sooner that I implement it? Um, and I think that, that this framework, you know, as your team has thought about this and, and really been a leader in adopting technology, taking new strategic approaches. Um, you know, I think this framework that, that you shared with us is, is really valuable and, and, you know, transferable to different businesses, different verticals and, you know, different types of technology too, right? I would love for people to, to um, use this framework for chargeback automation because it makes a lot of sense, but you can use it for other technology too. Um, so yeah, I think, I think being able to adopt this and, and think it through this way um, is, is very valuable. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what's next for NetProtect. Now that you guys have adopted automation, you've automated 100% of your chargeback process, um, you know, you can rest easy knowing that you're going to fight all of those and, and recover a hefty amount of revenue. Um, how else are you planning to leverage this capability? What, what are you kind of able to move your focus to now? So continuing to look at risk management, there's um, a concept of like redfish, bluefish, where you're trying to prevent chargebacks. And we don't want to be super aggressive that we have almost no chargebacks because then we'll end up catching a bunch of legitimate customers denying business there but actually spending time looking at the data on what are the commonalities between when we get fraud and uh, or when we get chargebacks that's not necessarily friendly. On the friendly front, you know, we spent a lot of time improving the way that we market what our service does and does not do. If you sign up, you know, with the wrong expectation, then you're more likely to receive the friendly fraud. And we've made great strides in improving their ease of access to talking to folks. It's not just email. Now you can do live chat and talk to them on the phone. And at that point, I'm not sure what more we can do to prevent friendly fraud outside of probably just continuing to improve our messaging across the board. And yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think, you know, that's exciting. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys are, are able to achieve there. Um, so, you know, kind of to sum up this discussion, which I think has been a great one, um, I kind of want to take us through some of at least my takeaways and, and Jacob, let me know if you have anything to add here. Um, so I think the first thing, right, is if, if your goal is protecting revenue and, and, you know, recovering revenue and having more dollars in the bank, right, then the best way to do that is to find a chargeback solution that is sustainable and scalable and to do that before um, you're in an emergency, before the house is on fire. Um, you know, secondly, I think based on what you said, Jacob, right, using your own, um, your own data and, and really putting together an ROI um, of, of potential savings is one of the best way to convince internal decision makers about 
um, you know, the benefits of, of adopting new technology. So, you know, in order to get that buy-in, the best way to do it is to show the money that's actually on the table and, and that can actually be um, driven for the business. Uh, and then I think the last thing which, which NetProtect was um, great at and is a great example of is that it's better to start somewhere than to not do anything at all, right? Um, if you're not sure about if something will work, don't be afraid to start a pilot uh, or do it with one processor or one business unit and, and show that in real time, have a real case um, for whether this works. Um, so those at least, you know, I think are, are the main things that we chatted through today. Jacob, do you have anything here that you wanted to highlight or add? I think you did a great job there. Awesome. Well, then I think we'll turn it over to q and I think we got some great questions that came in here. Um, yeah. So we do have a bunch of questions and definitely keep on submitting them as we go through this, but we will jump in with the first one, which is please go through your entire automation process in detail. What are you including in the chargeback response to help you achieve a 50% win rate? Um, and I don't know that they'll be able to answer this in full detail. Perhaps that might um, require a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but perhaps a, a high level, you can provide some high level information on how, um, how you guys have thought through templates in order to kind of improve that win rate. Yeah, so to give a little bit of background on this, and again, you know, if anyone wants a template consult or, or wants to understand what evidence they should include, they can definitely reach out um, to our team. If you just email hello at chargehound.com, um, you know, we can set up a conversation. But to give a high level, and then Jacob, I'd love to hear your perspective. The way that we think about our templates, right, is you're removing the opportunity cost of having a person that has to manually compile all of this evidence. So that cost of resources and time and scalability is gone. And so when you can respond with all of the correct evidence every single time, what would you include? Um, and so we, you know, make sure that templates are customized to um, each business that we work with, to each different type of transaction that a customer, um, or sorry, that a merchant uh, offers to customers. Um, and then, you know, what is the data that, that they're including? Take it through, you know, background in the transaction, IP addresses, um, proof of delivery, uh, you know, customer communication, things like that. But Jacob, tell us a little bit about, um, I know the templates were super important to you. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your experience there. Yeah. So I think part of the question for automation process, hopefully I'm answering this correct. So since we're in a subscription business, the way we understand the chargebacks is charge on, sees it, pulled in from Stripe or PayPal. They fire off a webhook to us. And at that point, our system will look to find all the relevant information. So that's the basic stuff, cardholder name, cardholder, cardholder address, and then some other ancillary information. So that would be, you know, basic examples. What does it look for uh, sign-up flow? Okay, that seems very basic, but we're very clear it's a subscription that renews. Um, how much it's going to renew for all of that information. And it's not good. This person signed up. Here's the IP. We think it's legitimate. Uh, and then when the dispute gets closed, whether that's in our favor or not, if it's not in our favor, then we catch the webhook and then we cancel the account at that point. So we don't actually touch the account until after we have a final answer from the banks, which takes roughly 45 to 60 days after we receive the dispute. Um, I also touched on earlier, so the 50% win rate, there is actually a decent difference between Stripe, which would just be traditional credit card, and PayPal disputes. I think PayPal just has a lot more information on the legitimacy of a transaction and whether or not it's friendly fraud or not than probably a traditional bank would. But in that, we, you know, if there's support tickets on some of the stuff that we have automated there, you know, we'll see, yes, this person has actually contacted us. Um, and here are the interactions that show it's, it's worthwhile or it's legitimate. Thanks, Polly. Thanks, Jacob. Um, and so one of the next questions that we have is, you stated you respond to 100% of your chargebacks. Does this include true fraud also, or do you just let those close out or accept? Yeah, so I can speak a little bit to this. Um, Chargehound, you know, what our technology does is it enables you to fight 
100% of your chargebacks. And, and what that does and, you know, what we recommend is that you go ahead and do that. Of course, we recommend having, you know, something on the front end to make sure you're, you're preventing true fraud uh, transactions and kind of minimizing, you know, how many chargebacks come in because of that. Um, and so it is a holistic process, but we recommend fighting 100% of your chargebacks. And that's because one, a lot of chargebacks that come in with a fraudulent reason code, right, uh, are not actually uh, criminal fraud. Uh, they, you know, a large portion of those can actually be due to friendly fraud and are actually winnable. And so unless you fight 100%, it can be hard to understand what the maximum amount of recoverable revenue is um, and, and what that opportunity is. And with automation, you know, again, there's no opportunity cost there. It doesn't cost you anything extra to fight all of your chargebacks. That being said, um, you know, we have workflow controls in place that allow merchants to um, decide which chargebacks they want to automatically fight or not. Um, and, you know, of course, as the merchant, you, you know your business better than um, Charton does. And so we, of course, work with you and, and make sure that you're happy with um, which chargebacks you submit and which you don't. Um, but, you know, Jacob, I know, I know you guys go ahead and submit 100% of your chargebacks. Do you have any perspective or, or recommendations there? We do. We don't want to receive money if it's not a legitimate charge. But at the end of the day, it's going to be hard for us to tell on if it's friendly fraud or not. I will say that one of the things, if you actually use the dashboard, charge home to respond to disputes and it's just as in this example, I pulled one up, low risk of criminal fraud. And I have seen the other way where it's seen as a potential high risk of criminal fraud. I think though, correct me if I'm wrong on the church on side, you all could say if it's a high risk of criminal fraud, then just auto accept the dispute. I think that's what you were trying to get at. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you both. And um, the next one we have is, we have two actually that are kind of related. Someone asked, what are the signs that your business is ready to automate? And also, what is the volume or number of monthly chargebacks you suggest to switch to automation? So um, do you both want to speak to that? Yeah, so from the charge on side, right, um, as soon as you are dedicating any resources to chargebacks, um, you know, it's worth it to automate. As soon as that becomes a meaningful ROI for you, whatever that means to your business, um, you know, we, we would say it's worthwhile to automate. And like Jacob, you've experienced those effects, you know, automating early, um, those effects multiply over time and, and scale with your business. So, you know, from our perspective, it's better to um, set something up for, for success before it's, it's broken or before the house is on fire. But Jacob, I'd love to, to get your perspective on it because I know that you have thought pretty deeply about this question. Yeah, we set it up after the house was on fire. Um, <laughs> and that's okay too. <laughs> from my perspective, if I was spending more than say two hours a month or not responding at all, I would start working towards full automation. And depending on what kind of business you run, that could be really tough. If you don't have software engineers, then that could be a very confusing world to navigate. Um, but even if that's the case, then you can do the halfway automation like we did for a whole year or so. Um, you know, reminiscing, I was reminiscing before, you know, this preparation for this webinar, that it worked really good when it was halfway automated. So if that's all you can get to without, you know, choosing to not forgo another project that's it's worthwhile for you, then that that's fine as well. Do it. You can do it in baby steps. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. And kind of the second part of that question: Is there a volume or number of monthly chargebacks you suggest to switch to automation? So at Chargeon, what we really try to focus on, and and the way that we try to show value uh, value to our merchants is um, in that ROI, right? So um, with with real numbers, the, the dollars that you're receiving in chargebacks each month, the cost that you're currently incurring by not fighting them or fighting manually, and then the results you could see on the other side if you used um, charge on and, and used automation instead, we really try to focus on that bottom line. And so I don't think that there's one um, magical number uh, for every type of merchant, but I think that as soon as that ROI makes sense, which can be very early for your business, um, you know, Chargeon 
is performance based. So uh, Jacob, I know I know you know this, but but we um, you know our our fees are are tied to how many dollars we actually win back for you, so that you always um, net out with more money in the bank at the end. And so um, with our model and, and with our technology, that making that ROI makes sense um, can can be pretty easy. Um, I would say that we drive the most value at scale. So of course, if you have a meaningful number of dollars and a meaningful number of chargebacks and or you're experiencing hyper growth as a business, that's really a sweet spot. Um, you're just gonna see, and Jacob, you've seen this, right? The, the value um, increases tremendously with scale. Um, but you know, definitely if, if you're wondering if it's the right time to automate uh, your chargebacks, you know, reach out anytime to us and, and we're happy to, to walk you through what that ROI looks like. Great. And <clears throat> the next question is, what's your win rate with merchants whose business is 100% digital? Yeah, so super relevant question. Uh, we get questions around win rate a, a lot. Um, and something that I want to highlight is always think, think about um, the submission rate that you're tying to your win rate. So again, are you submitting 10% <clears throat> and winning 100% of those? Well, then your win rate right, is, is, is really tied to that 10% submission rate. Um, versus 100% submission rate. So I just want to highlight that, um, you know, one more time. And then, um, you know, win rates, they can vary based on your rates of criminal fraud, um, your, um, you know, other factors of your business. But, you know, this webinar is focused on, on NetProtect. Um, and so if you're looking for an example of what you can achieve as a primarily digital business, I think this is a great one. The results that we've talked about here are, are really strong and, and are, you know, fairly typical of what we see from our digital merchants. Great, that makes a lot of sense. And a couple more questions here, and I know we have about, about seven minutes left before um, we'll be wrapping up, but the question is, are you integrated with traditional acquirers, Chase, WorldPlay, First Data, et cetera? Yeah, so, you know, with a lot of um, some of these legacy payment processors, it really depends a lot on your setup with that processor as a merchant. Um, the short answer is, you know, yes, those those integrations are technically feasible um, and we can talk about it and, and tell you how, <clears throat> excuse me, tell you tell you how we would get those done. Um, it's, I guess, kind of the longer answer is it's a case by case basis. We need to talk to you about your setup. Um, but I can tell you that for those legacy processors, you know, we are the only uh, solution that, that will be able to fully automate um, your chargebacks, uh, you know, regardless of your payment processor. And what fields or evidence do you recommend providing in the dispute response? I think you, Jacob and Paul, we have touched on this a little bit, um, but perhaps you could elaborate. Yeah, Jacob, I'm gonna hand this one over to you because I know, um, you know you firsthand worked with us on your templates. I think there's a lot of value to understand, you know, IP address, for example, a basic thing that you can provide, but just show that they, they bought it from where they normally are in the, at least whenever my cards have been stolen, they're always used pretty far away. Although I did just recently have my cards from last year and was used locally around town. I think that's pretty clear to the credit card processor. Probably was a legitimate charge. And then looking at, you know, they bought it on this IP, did they change to another one before they verified the email, which is something that we have to do. Um, you know, I talked about having support tickets. You know, is there someone who's defrauding you probably is going to be talking with your support team? At least that is the feeling that I get. And then if you can provide some context around that, just really that they legitimately wanted it, then that helps you with that friendly fraud. Great, thank you. And um, we're here to our last uh, submitted question. Um, so you have about 30 more seconds to submit if you have anything else on your mind. Um, but the question is, does PayPal or Stripe know that the chargebacks have been disputed by an automated process? If so, does that affect the win rate or disposition of the chargeback case? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, like we mentioned a little bit earlier, ChargeHunt is a verified partner of Stripe. You can find us on their partner page. 
Um, we're also a strategic partner to PayPal and Braintree. And so, you know, we work closely with them to um, make sure that our disputes submit all of the most compelling evidence and, um, you know, are, are very seamless with, uh, with their systems and their technology and their process as well. Uh, and so, you know, when we, when we submit those responses on your behalf, we don't brand them uh, and, and say they're charge on. We say they're coming from, from your business and we prove, you know, exactly why your business is, is a legitimate one. Um, and so, you know, we don't necessarily let them know that these are automated representments. Uh, if you look at the documents, right, they are very clean, very human readable. The point of them is not um, to look computer generated, right? The, the point is that, um, you know, in a readable and concise way, they, they uh, show all of the, the compelling evidence that you need to win the chargeback. Um, we do, you know, try to work closely with all of our partners to make sure that the evidence we submit is in line with their recommendations. We've spoken to issuers and acquirers and payment processors, you know, all of our partners and in each step along the way um, to make sure that we're getting feedback, uh, you know, all the time and, and our templates are continually optimized to be, you know, stronger than, you know, anything else you could possibly submit. Great. Well, that was the last of the questions and we have about three minutes left. So I think that's the perfect time to wrap things up. But I wanted to thank everyone for being here. Um, Pahalvi has now shared our contact information for Chargehound and NetProtect. So if you do have additional questions, please feel free to reach out. We're always here to answer them. And Pahalvi, Jacob, thank you so much for being here. Do you guys have any any final words you want to leave people with? No, I think um, we covered a lot of great information today. Uh, if anyone has any questions, of course, feel free to reach out. Um, and yeah, Jacob, just thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's obviously been a pleasure uh, being on this webinar with you today and, and working with you over the years and just, you know, really excited for, for what NetProtect is going to you know, lead in the future. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Well, everyone, have a great rest of your Thursday. Thanks.